This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa. Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S, dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book 7 Modern Times, Madame Saray. Book 7, Chapter 7 The First Consequences. When Eveline confided to Paul Visere that she had never experienced anything similar, he did not believe her. He had had a good deal to do with women, and knew that they readily say these things to men in order to make them more in love with them. Thus his experience, as sometimes happens, made him disregard the truth. Incredulous but gratified all the same, he soon felt love and something more for her. This state at first seemed favorable to his intellectual faculties. Visere delivered in the chief town of his constituency a speech full of grace, brilliant and happy, which was considered to be a masterpiece. The reopening of Parliament was serene. A few isolated jealousies, a few timid ambitions raised their heads in the House, and that was all. A smile from the Prime Minister was enough to dissipate these shadows. She and he saw each other twice a day, and wrote to each other in the interval. He was accustomed to intimate relationships, was adroit, and knew how to dissimulate. But Eveline displayed a foolish imprudence. She made herself conspicuous with him in drawing-rooms, at the theatre, in the house, and at the embassies. She wore her love upon her face, upon her whole person, in her moist glances, in the languishing smile of her lips, in the heaving of her breast, in all her heightened, agitated, and distracted beauty. Soon the entire country knew of their intimacy. Foreign courts were informed of it. The President of the Republic and Eveline's husband alone remained in ignorance. The President became acquainted with it in the country through a misplaced police report which found its way, it is not known how, into his portmanteau. Hippolyte Serre, without being either very subtle or very perspicacious, noticed that there was something different in his home. Eveline, who quite lately had interested herself in his affairs, and shown, if not tenderness, at least affection towards him, displayed henceforth nothing but indifference and repulsion. She had always had periods of absence, and made prolonged visits to the charity of St. Orborosia. Now she went out in the morning, remained out all day, and sat down to dinner at nine o'clock in the evening, with the face of a somnambulist. Her husband thought it absurd. However, he might perhaps have never known the reason for this, a profound ignorance of women, a crass confidence in his own merit and in his own fortune, might perhaps have always hidden the truth from him if the two lovers had not, so to speak, compelled him to discover it. When Paul Visere went to Eveline's house and found her alone, they used to say as they embraced each other, Not, not here, not, not here. here, and immediately they affected an extreme reserve. That was their invariable rule. Now one day, Paul Visere went to the house of his colleague Serre, with whom he had an engagement. It was Eveline who received him, the Minister of Commerce being delayed by a commission. Not, Not here, here, said the lovers, smiling. They said it, mouth to mouth, embracing and clasping each other. They were still saying it when Hippolyte Serre entered the drawing-room. Paul Visere did not lose his presence of mind. He declared to Madame Serret that he would give up his attempt to take the dust out of her eye. By this attitude he did not deceive the husband, but he was able to leave the room with some dignity. Hippolyte Serret was thunderstruck. Eveline's conduct appeared incomprehensible to him. He asked her what reason she had for it. Why? Why? He kept repeating continually. Why? She denied everything, not to convince him, for he had seen them but from expediency and good taste, and to avoid painful explanations. Hippolyte Serre suffered all the tortures of jealousy. He admitted it to himself. He kept saying inwardly, I am a strong man. I am clad in armor. But the wound is underneath. It is in my heart. And turning towards his wife, who looked beautiful in her guilt, he would say, It ought not to have been with him. He was right. Eveline ought not to have loved in government circles. He suffered so much that he took up his revolver, exclaiming, I will go and kill him. But he remembered that a minister of commerce cannot kill his own prime minister, and he put his revolver back into his drawer. The weeks passed without calming his sufferings. 
Each morning he buckled his strong man's armor over his wound and sought in work and fame the peace that fled from him. Every Sunday he inaugurated busts, statues, fountains, artesian wells, hospitals, dispensaries, railways, canals, public markets, drainage systems, triumphal arches, and slaughterhouses, and delivered moving speeches on each of these occasions. His fervid activity devoured whole piles of documents. He changed the colors of the postage stamps fourteen times in one week. Nevertheless, he gave vent to outbursts of grief and rage that drove him insane. For whole days his reason abandoned him. If he had been in the employment of a private administration, this would have been noticed immediately. But it is much more difficult to discover insanity or frenzy in the conduct of affairs of state. At that moment the government employees were forming themselves into associations and federations amid a ferment that was giving alarm both to the Parliament and to public feeling. The postmen were especially prominent in their enthusiasm for trade unions. Hippolytus Serre informed them in a circular that their action was strictly legal. The following day he sent out a second circular forbidding all associations of government employees as illegal. He dismissed 180 postmen, reinstated them, reprimanded them, and awarded them gratuities. At cabinet councils he was always on the point of bursting forth. The presence of the head of state scarcely restrained him within the limits of the decencies, and as he did not dare to attack his rival, he consoled himself by heaping invectives upon General Debonaire, the respected minister of war. The general did not hear them, for he was deaf, and occupied himself in composing verses for the Baroness Bilderman. Hippolytus Serre offered an indistinct opposition to everything the prime minister proposed. In one word, he was a madman. One faculty alone escaped the ruin of his intellect. He retained his parliamentary sense, his consciousness of the temper of majorities, his thorough knowledge of groups, and his certainty of the direction in which affairs were moving. End of Book 7, Chapter 7